Welcome everyone to what is our fifth webinar of this year and to today's discussion on the current investment trends that we're currently tracking across North America in the pharma and biotech sector. Uh, my name is Shaheen Chahan and I'm the Vice President for Global Analytics and based in our Dubai office. Uh, before we start, I would just like to say a very big thank you to today's um, webinar sponsor, ACI Controls. I'm also uh, delighted to be joined today by Annette Kruger. Uh, Annette is our VP of Pharma and Biotech Global Research, and she's based in our Sugarland, uh, Texas head office. Now, in terms of the agenda, um, we will be taking, as I said, a, a look primarily across the North American market, although uh, we will be uh, looking at some of our European numbers that we're currently tracking at the moment. Um, for North America, we will be looking at the latest project spending statistics and, and taking a bit of a deep dive into some of the volumes. And obviously, um, having Annette on the call, we'll be discussing the main drivers that are shaping those numbers. So moving swiftly on, um, currently we have just over $37 billion worth of active projects, that's about 517 projects, which are currently under construction. Uh, now, Annette, if I could bring you into the discussion now, um, what does the next 24-month pipeline look like? So that's spending, which is still at the planning and engineering stage. What do the numbers look like? We're just under $30 billion, and it's growing every day. Uh, when we last pulled the numbers directly from the database, our platform, we had 29 billion over 1,100 projects in planning and engineering, looking at the, over the next two years starting construction. And then when you go beyond that, if you take from 2017 forward, we bump up to 1,200 projects and 35 billion. And these are ones that have a future kickoff date. It's very, um, it's very active right now. And it just keeps growing. Even for a mature market like North America, it's still the largest market. And as such, it's drawing a lot of capital investment. So, Annette, that's about 70-odd billion or 71 billion, if you've, as you've got here on, on the slide, across uh, over 2,000 projects. So that's including the under construction. Now, this is a view of how that 71 billion of active pharma and biotech spending is breaking down. And this is a breakdown by the individual uh, respective project types. Now, uh, before, Ines, I start you know, prodding you for what are the drivers and shaping the kind of the spread of spending that we've, we're seeing here at the moment, perhaps you could just uh, explain a little or give some definitions around what type of investment activity uh, do we typically see in these various three categories of, of grassroots new plants versus implant and then and then versus maintenance? What, what are we typically seeing in terms of dollar spend? We Every time we think, all right, there's going to be a slowdown in grassroots plants. It's just not going to happen. They're not just – the industry's mature, as I had said. Bam, they come out with a billion-dollar new campus or – a standalone facility in a different location for a new product. What's unique a little bit to our industry, you'll notice I put together the grassroots slash new plant. Grassroot, of course, is like everybody knows from the ground up, fresh new plant that they're establishing operations. Well, a new plant in our industry, we have such a huge volume of when all of the plants closed several years ago when the industry was reorganizing, we had a lot of vacant plants. Well, we're getting a lot of activity where people are establishing operations in those former manufacturing plants, but they're establishing their first operation there at that site. So those are considered new plants in our industry. When somebody is opening up at a location for the first time under their name or their badge, and those are running about dead even with expansions of existing plants. Um, if somebody asked me, What's more typical, an expansion of an existing facility or a brand new facility? I'd say dead even. And if you look at the numbers, they are almost dead even. And I had to check those over and over. I thought, well, that's just too neat. But um, the only difference is the expansions, we've got just over 500. So it's a little lower 
per project average total investment value, but they tend to run neck and neck. And the implant spending, of course, um, we're going to see that increasing. Um, that's, that's pure uncovered projects. You're calling in and you're finding out they're doing equipment upgrades, um, changing maybe their plant control systems, it, a multitude of things. And of course, maintenance. Maintenance is, like any industry, it's essential in ours. You have to maintain these facilities to the utmost standards. Now, here's a, um, uh, a very colorful historical view of the spending, which I think, you know, I think it quite nicely puts uh, the next two years of planned spending, certainly into context of what we've seen over the last three to four years. Now, for me, there's a couple of things I'd, I'd like to uh, press you on, but the first, the, the thing that stands out the most for me, really, the most noteworthy, is when I'm looking at those 2008 num 18 numbers, that 9.9, .9, nearly $10 billion, uh, mm -hmm. it seems like a severe fall away. Are, are, we, are we seeing an end to the bull run that started in, I guess, 2015? Is, is 2018 going to be a, a bad year for investments? <laughs> you know, er never say never, Shaheen. I have found that in the industry. It's kind of like um, rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated. So it goes with the pharmaceutical industry. Um, she having just under 10 billion for kickoff next year, it's only April. We, um, I would not expect it to be like 25 billion. We'll at least hold the same, maybe go up one or two percent from this year. But we're seeming to hold the line right at 19 to 20 billion per year. It's, um, because as we're getting future kickoff projects, we also do fill-ins as we call in, as we're calling these plants, and we're finding out things. If I find a sizable project that is already under construction, we're going to put it in because the historical data is just as important as future data, depending on what a client's needs are. Um, that bull run that we jumped up, you see the confidence in the industry 2015, 2016, because if you go back even further before 2013, it was kind of puny, just to put it in plain English. Um, nobody knew what was going on. Everybody was closing plants. The huge merger and acquisition activity just started really getting big. And all of a sudden, fewer major players at the top. And that's when everybody said, Pharma's golden years are past. No more $1,000 a square foot plants. And as soon as you say that, we started seeing an uptick. We started seeing the massive campuses that they said they'd never build again. And right now we've got a $2 billion plant under construction in North Carolina for active pharmaceutical ingredients. That came out of nowhere. Um, if you would have asked me two years ago, three years ago, are we going to see projects of that size? Nah, not so much. So I've learned never to say never. I'd rather go a little low and say, all right, 2018, we'll hit 19, 20 billion in kickoffs. There'll probably be more, but um, I'll go low for now and say, but you know, that's not so low when you consider there's so many opportunities because it's not the same industry that it was five or six years ago. There's new players. All of the executives were replaced in all the major pharma companies, the bulk of them, not every single one. So there's new opportunities available that weren't available a short time ago. Now, Annette, um, obviously under the new Trump administration, there is a big emphasis and focus on reshoring and bringing a lot of manufacturing uh, back onto uh, US, into the US. Now, are we seeing the same sort of um, activity with the pharma and biotech sector, or is it just the pharma side, or is it also biotech as well? And do you think that may help support some of those 2018 numbers? Absolutely. What everybody has to remember, and it's hard because I, I, I want everybody healthy, pharma and bio are businesses. And if they don't make money, if there's no profit, they're not going to stay in business. So, of course, the financial incentives to reshore, to come back, are huge to them. Um, 
Puerto Rico is trying to place itself and hopefully will reacquire some of the projects in manufacturing that they lost when their tax laws changed that made it less attractive to the industry. Right now, pharma and biotech, you can't really separate the two, okay? 99% uh, of all big pharma companies, I mean, they have biological divisions. It, they've, they've all pretty well enmeshed, even though the, the source of the drug is different. Um, you, you see a great alliance between Europe and North America. Same kind of standards, same kind of mature market. Um, not only will the Trump uh, initiatives, if they come to pass, spur growth in both areas, there's been something else going on as far as quality issues. Back in the day when everything was outsourced to India and China, I mean, that was just the way it was, everything. Well, regulatory issues came up. There were problems with quality, big quality. You want to save money. Remember I said they're businesses. Well, you can't kill your patients. It's just, it's not a good business model. So what they're doing is they're bringing a lot of this back into their fold or dealing with companies that they're more closely allied to either here or in Europe. So yeah, it's positive. And industry-wise, they're expecting, I mean, they're, they're going to give up some stuff. There'll be some price controls, but they'll give away the cheap drugs. They, they, they want everybody's hands off the more expensive ones. And I, I think that's how it'll shake out. They're looking at a very profitable next, yeah, five, three to five years. But I don't think we'll have any huge growth spurts. It'll just help us maintain and maybe beat those numbers a little bit. Now, Ned, this is a slightly different view or a different cut of the that $71 billion that's currently active. Uh, and this is a, a view of how that those dollars are distributed. And here we've got various market regions. Now, um, just looking across this sort of sea of numbers, uh, are there any regional breakouts that we have seen as being noteworthy for uh, for example, I mean, I, I was just looking at the, the Northeast, uh, and I recall that seems to have improved since the last time we did this webinar, which is back, back last year. So uh, are we seeing anything change in terms of the, the spatial distribution of where, where the investments are? Well, that, this, it's interesting that you bring up the Northeast. It plays with what I said about all of those plants closing years ago. Um, the Northeast took a huge beating. And I'm talking with traditional pharma, the, you know, your pills, your capsules, your over-the-counters, all the, all the drugs we know and love that we use a lot of, some of us, and um, legally. Uh, what happened was thousands of people were laid off, scores of plants were closed. Well, these were state-of-the-art manufacturing plants. Granted, they were outdated, but leading back to what we discussed also on the second, the last slide, a lot of those companies from India that have seen contracts disappear or abate are coming in and buying these plants and refurbishing them and establishing operations here in the States in hopes of recapturing some of that lost market as well as being able to snap up a state-of-the-art plant that takes maybe five or ten million dollars to do some retooling and you know you're, you're making generics um, generics are easier to produce um, that's what these plants were geared like I said the more standard traditional pharmaceuticals um, so the Northeast thankfully is regaining some of its former glory um, kind of hit or miss a little bit different regions New York is drawing a lot of this investment we'll find companies operating under several different names owning half a dozen plants, and you find out they're all sourced out of the same place. Uh, Mid-Atlantic is always strong. I mean, that's a traditional stronghold of the industry, as is the West Coast. That's never going to change. What has changed is everybody's seeing expanded investment because the days of project shopping still exist. They give these projects fancy names like Project Orca or Project Source, and they fly all over the country saying, 
you give us enough money, enough tax incentives, you might as well throw in the land while you're at it, and we'll build, your, we'll build our project here. And it works. It absolutely works. Texas is slowly trying to make a presence in the industry, which many have talked about for years. With our huge medical center that we have right here in Houston, where's pharma? Where's bio? Now, between College Station and what's happening at the med center, we're starting to see commercial ventures come in. GlaxoSmithKline is in College Station working on that National Vaccine Institute, and Johnson & Johnson just opened up what they call a business accelerator at the Texas Med Center. And that's a great, great thing. And that can happen anywhere. Um, cost of living, some of these small regions that are a little bit more out of the way are attractive because the cost of living for their employees is much more reasonable than trying to pay for your bills in Massachusetts or California. No, Annette, um, this is just uh, another look of uh, at what we're seeing since, and this is a, a view from 2015 and, and, and into 17. Now, um, we know, obviously, that not all of the projects that we track um, you know, will always move forward as a schedule. Some obviously get canceled, some uh, get put on hold, and some, uh, you know, as a, as a minimum, do get pushed out into latter years. Now, what I have noticed when we were looking at, at, at this particular view and the data that's underlying this is that um, your sector typically seems to have uh, much higher project realization rates, or, or, or inversely, it has lower volumes of project fallout. Would you say that that's a, a correct observation? And could you possibly explain to folks what the forecast and the actual, what the, what's the difference between those two numbers? When we say that, if I, um, a perfect example is 2015. We'll just start with that. It was estimated, forecast, written, projected, I mean actual reports, that during the year of 2015, $16.5 billion would start construction. Projects would be start construction in that 12-month period. What actually happened was a billion less. 2016, same difference. But you'll notice those numbers are very close. You don't just dream up a plant overnight and build it. Um, you don't put all of the money that has to be invested into the planning long before you get to construction, especially with all the technology changes that are going on, then you've got regulatory issues. It's not something discussed lightly. And then, oh, well, we're not going to do it. What I have seen, if a project gets canceled or put on hold, we have a huge restart rate. We track projects that I, I, I might have written in 2003. That's my, that's my new number for the past, oh, I'd say three months where I resurrected a project that was first reported in 2003 because the company was sold several times. But the planning was there, the land was there, and they're going to build it. Um, that's an extreme, but most projects do come to fruition. Where we see it, where we see it, things keep getting delayed. Everybody wants to get in the pharma bio bucks. There's so much money. There's there's so much money in this industry. So we'll get several people, they'll look at the big real estate investment trusts like Biomed or Forest and um, Alexandria, which is the biggest, one of the biggest. I never want to say anything is the largest because they would argue with that. Well, these folks know what they're doing. That's where they're going to build the suit. I'm going to build this huge tower for research, maybe some pilot manufacturing. Your Pfizer, you're going to come lease it from me but I'm going to develop it and build it. Well, other folks are trying to get some of that money. So we'll get several private business people. They'll come up with some money, and they shop these ideas. We're going to build a $100 million biotech park, and it's going to be filled. Those can fall out. Those get a lot of interest at the beginning, but not all of them. We have a $100 million one that's about to start up in Massachusetts. And again, it's been kicking around for a while. It just has to have everything fall into place. So if a project does get ha canceled or put on hold, it tends to get resurrected down the road. 
So dates are always fluid, but the dollars usually get spent. Well, just staying with uh, some of those big ticket uh, projects that you were just referencing there, here's a view of uh, the top 15 active uh, projects by CapEx, and these are projects which are uh, at $200 million and, and, and above. Now, what, it's, what it seems just when we're looking at the, the, the project name is it appears a fairly broad range of uh, projects in terms of the types of sectors uh, that, are, that fall within the pharma and biotech industry. Uh, my main question is, are, are we seeing any uh, kind of major changes in the types of investors or uh, participants or business models that are that are that are creeping into the market that are driving some of these big projects. No, actually, what's interesting is the biologicals, of course, are going forward. I mean, it, it, it's just new things are being discovered every day. New therapeutic um, answers are coming up every day. Some people will address manufacturing in-house, others want to shop it out. If you look down uh, to the Portsmouth Biologics from Lanza, Lanza is a major contract manufacturer. They are very well respected within the industry. I mean, they're, they're the gold standard. Um, they want to be able to address several different types of products within this expansion. Um, what I am seeing, if you'll go up a few, the Vetter Project in De Plaine, they're buying an old Salvation Army site. And that's a huge investment. Um, when I talked to them in Germany prior to writing this project, um, they, they feel the same way as what I had said earlier. What's good in Europe is good in the United States, and they see the market for this. It gives a very good, I mean, they're not worried about having any customers. Again, a very well-established company, very respected. You're seeing some major players in the contract manufacturing market. Um, are all that big? No, no. Contract manufacturers might lay out $10 million for a new production line, you know, a dedicated production line, depending on the client. Um, but there is, it, it is a growing market. What I loved about this, and this was not seeded, I didn't cherry-pick projects, I literally went in for the top 15 manufacturing projects. And it gave a full range of the type of projects that we cover. And it shows you that it's all activity. It's all sectors. Um, the CSL bearing in Bradley, uh, we're seeing a lot of plasma fractionation plants globally. There's a, a, a huge spike, uh, a spike in that spending. And that's all over the world. Um, those are blood-based therapeutics. Think of hemophilia. You don't hear it a lot, but it, it, it's a problem. And I've noticed an uptick in that. Of course, vaccines, uh, Metacago's in Quebec City, and then again, Sanofi in Toronto. Um, that project in Toronto, uh, again, that was pr first proposed many years ago. And the technology has evolved and the research, so it's actually a different type product for the vaccine that's going to be made there. But this is a great, great representation of what's going on in the industry, which is basically everything, all sectors are spending money. So, Annette, we, we've obviously seen, you know, there is a big range of of projects that are currently shaping the certainly the, the higher end, the bigger ticket sized uh, projects that that part of the market. Now, have we seen any changes, or has has the market altered in terms of the makeup or the configuration of what a pharma or biotech facility looks like today? And ultimately, has the kind of composition of the equipment requirements changed over the last few years? Okay, they've gotten more expensive, like everything, but the greatest Two things, if I'm going to pull out two things that are the most impactful in the industry right now, and it doesn't matter where you are, like I said, globally this applies. The single-use systems versus fixed. Disposable, we hear disposable. Um, it is preferable in many circumstances for a multitude of reasons. Um, because just as I said, they build huge 
manufacturing campuses, they also take years and years to build. So the modular, smaller plants for smaller production runs, for precision medicine, you know, you've got a smaller client base. You're just charging a lot more money. It's much more advantageous in many cases to be able to go completely disposable. And when I'm saying disposable, I mean, there's a fixed unit, but it's the equipment, the, the bags and the guts of the system are disposable single use. Um, it's very attractive because you can get a plant up and running in under 18 months as opposed to five years. Um, also, the standard plants, the huge, you know, I know Metamune, when I was touring their facility in Frederick, Maryland, uh, they had the massive bioreactor, you know, it's two stories tall, and then they've got the single-use disposable systems because they're a contract manufacturer there too. And I asked, is this going to replace it? And they said, never. I mean, not in their case. Are there some companies that will use strictly single-use disposable? Yes. But the fixed stainless steel and all the various materials that they're made out of, bioreactors and reactors aren't going anywhere quick. It's just an addition. Also, the whole batch versus continuous. Many companies are switching from batch runs to continuous. There's still a lot of discussion. It involves retooling a lot of equipment swaps. That was a big talk at Interfax, a lot of interest in that, and a lot of discussion on it. Um, the rest of the things that I've put on here, I mean, there's so much because technology is evolving. Um, that's the beauty of the industry. They're always inventing new things. They're discovering new things. And to do that, they have to find out the best way to manufacture it safely, economically, and to please to all the powers that be that are overseeing all of this including the federal government, you know, the FDA. Um, I've seen a lot of um, interest and more activity in the plant automation because there's a new mandate called serialization that affects every single manufacturer of a drug product. At the end of this year, and then all, basically all products in the industry through the end of 2018, and that's going to really hit the software, packaging, that aspect of all manufacturers, because they're going to track a drug from the moment it's, con it's made, it started to make, to the time you get it dispensed to you, so they can track it back to the, all of its origins, where it's been. So the plant automation, uh, that, that's not a fair representation of what I said, plant automation. I think any kind of control any kind of systems within the plant. Um, Lyophilization, that's everybody's gold standard for freeze drying a wet product into a dry product. And um, there's different kinds of freeze dryers, but lyophilization is the most preferred. Explosion proof sealed systems have to in the type of environment that they're manufacturing these drugs. Um, it's an interesting application. They literally seal all of your equipment that shouldn't get wet or can't be open to the system. It's a multitude of reasons. People go, what do you mean? It's going to all explode? In some cases, yes. But other cases, it's to seal everything off because um, it's got to be clean. Uh, waste treatment, uh, like I said, these were just things that came to me saying yes. And for every one of these, there's another three dozen that we're seeing activity in. They're all important. Now, Ned, I just wanted to uh, just change tack a little bit. Uh, I did reference that we were going to look at some European numbers. And now, I, I know you are still you know, building out the team in Europe, and obviously your coverage is starting to increase, and it's increased pretty much exponentially since we last sat and did this webinar. Now, my first question is you know, an obvious one, which is why are you focusing and why are you investing uh, in building out our coverage for Europe and building out the team there to research it? And secondly, um, in terms of the trends and drivers, um, is it a similar market or are we seeing a, a very different type of um, investment infrastructure landscape to the U.S.? Okay, well, to answer your first question, the reason we are building it out was demand. Um, to provide the same sort of reporting that we have here, it's, pharma is a tricky industry and you can't look at the whole market especially a mature market, 
and not have Europe. Clients wanted it. It, it. It's a perfect. It's a perfect fit because it does mirror a lot of our activity. Um, many of the companies, whether they're based here or in Europe, have operations in either place. Um, I mentioned that Vetter project. Uh, the power people on that, the lead people, they're based in Germany. Vice versa for our projects. You would have, let's say, a Pfizer project going on in Ireland or when they're canceling a project. They have the same factors going on there. Now where we see a little bit, I want to say different projects, but it kind of mirrors what's going on in New York. If you get further into Eastern Europe, we're seeing an enormous uptick of, of activity, which totally surprised me. They're going generics. Excuse me more of the generics. And you'll hear the term biosimilars. You can't call a biological drug a generic because it can't be a perfect duplicate of the original drug because a biological is based on a living cell. And you, we're, we're not good at replicating exact life. So they call it a biosimilar. A lot of the Eastern European companies are investing heavily in that because everybody's getting more access to the drugs. And they would just as soon give a lower cost, generic, biosimilar, and some of the companies are agreeing to it in certain areas. Europe, though, uh, we're seeing the same types of projects. Um, it's astounding to me because, again, it's a very, very mature market. But that is, it's a large market. They, they're, they're a gold standard for manufacturing, just like North America is. Same standards, sometimes tougher. Um, they also blew back about the, they push back. They stop shipments at their docks of defective drugs coming from Asia. They couldn't do it. So that did give a, a, a blowback for um, manufacturing. And with the whole Brexit, um, we're just expecting, you know, everybody said everything's going to change. The UK is gone. And all it's going to do is give more activity, be, activity. Just how we're worried, people are worried the new um, presidency and the new administration would affect us negatively here. Same over there. This industry is a survivor. I don't care what you throw at it, what laws change, who's in charge. They're going to find a way to make money. And so it's, um, yeah, I expect uh, it won't, how can I, I don't ever want to say won't. I expect to keep seeing the same kind of growth that we have here. We're going to have a little more activity over there while we're filling because it is new and I'm trying to get as much. So we've got a huge research group over there, a very good research group trying to uncover. We're putting in our plant platform. So it's exciting. It's just exciting. As is our Latin America. We've just launched that because there's a lot of activity in, again, they're providing access to drugs and medical devices that uh, were never available before for many people. Okay, Ned, so that, that pretty much brings us to the end of our session and obviously in conclusion, uh, what I'd like you to do is if you could possibly just give out uh, a couple of your top line observations that you think folks uh, should keep an eye on this year. The industry as a whole, watch it, like I said, take away, never say never, because it's going to continue on an upward trend. Of course, for new areas, there's going to be a higher growth rate. It's like any time you introduce something to a new location, uh, they've got to build the infrastructure. They've got to build the plants. They've got to build the manufacturing out. So it's, it's wonderful. And it's mainly because, like I said, product access and the affordability of it. The re it just stands to reason um, the percentage of growth will be higher in certain areas. The dollar spend might not be as great because it is less expensive to build a plant to manufacture generics over-the-counter medication than it is, you know, an advanced biological facility. Um, the in-house production versus outsourcing, both are growing. Um, for everybody that wants to bring in their API production in-house and hold it close to them, which has been a big shift in some cases, there's other companies with these limited-run drugs that would just as soon hire a company and say you put in some dedicated production lines and we're good to go because it's not a massive product run. Um, 
because it's reinventing itself all the time. New products, new technologies. Um, it, there's no other choice but spending and investing in this equipment and the technologies to support it, all of the supporting equipment. This precision medicine is a huge, huge focus of the industry because it's true. What one drug does for one person doesn't for another. They could have the identical ailment. And what works for this one doesn't for that. That costs a lot of money, and that's why we have a lot of research going on. It's, um, again, it's a limited, it's almost back to the old-fashioned pharmaceutical compounding where the druggist is mission drugs in a little pot with a pestle. Well, take that up a little bit, and there's even new positions growing in the industry for that. Um, the demand for generics, biosimilars, always, always important. People want to save money, and a lot of people don't. A lot of people won't use a drug. If they're fortunate enough to be able to afford it, they'll pay for the brand name. And the whole regulatory, we like laws, and our, our industry is regulated more heavily than many. Of course, as it well should be, because the whole point is to uh, give us a better life, keep us alive a long time, and that's about what we're all about. And uh, thank you so much for uh, having this today. And you know me, I could go on for hours about the industry. It's fascinating. And I wish everybody success within it. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Annette, for sharing uh, you know today's observations and, and certainly your, uh, your your thoughts. Uh, and obviously, a very big thank you to today's sponsor, the ACI Controls. Thank you very much. Um, as always, those who have attended uh, the call today, you can obviously get uh, access to a copy of this recording of the uh, of the presentation and a soft copy of the of the deck uh, just by uh, visiting our uh, our portal. Uh, more importantly, though, uh, please uh, do stay in touch this year. Um, we will be hosting a number of other webinars throughout the year. The next session that we do have uh, is actually next month, and that is the Asian and Middle East Power Outlook, where we'll be looking at spending trends across uh, those two big block markets, uh, and that's going to be on May the 10th. So hopefully we'll get a chance to speak uh, again. Uh, and until then, I'd just like to obviously bid you goodbye and uh, many thanks for joining today. Thank you.